Good morning. We are pleased to have you back with us today for this virtual media conference by the Ministry of Health as we seek to keep you informed of the national COVID-19 response. Here to discuss the latest COVID-19 updates with us are Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director of the Epidemiology Division at the Ministry of Health, Mr. Ronald Soyafat, CEO of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, and Mr. Roshan Siram Singh, GIS Manager for the Ministry of Health. I'm Candice Alcantara, Manager Corporate Communication, and your moderator this morning. Dr. Hines will deliver today's clinical update and give us some additional epidemiological information. Thank you, Ms. Alcantara. Good morning to my colleagues, Mr. Soyafat and Mr. C. Ram Singh. Good morning to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. The clinical update for the day ending 4 p.m. Friday the 4th of, sorry, Friday the 9th of April is as follows. At that time, we had conducted 115,228 tests with 54,807 of those being in the private sector. Of those tests, 8,323 turned out positive, inclusive of 145 deaths, and we extend our condolences to the members of those bereaved families. There have been 7,712 recovered persons, and there are currently 466 active cases broken down as follows. There are 357 currently in home isolation. There are eight in step-down facilities, all at the UED Bay facility. There are 54 in hospital, and the hospital distribution for the patients is as follows. In the Kuva Medical and Multi-Training Facility, there are 33 patients, with five of them in ICU and one in HDU. At the Cora Facility, there are six patients, and at the Scarborough General Facility at the Fort, there are 15 individuals. There have been 47 new confirmed cases for the, day, for the date the 9th of April, and those would have come from samples received between the 6th and the 8th of April. I'd like to move directly into the epidemiologic update, so if we can have the slides. First, we want to start with the continuing update of our epidemic curve. Now, we have two versions of this today. This one shows you the daily cases and the black dotted line running through them, which is that rolling average. Starting on the left, we see the gray section, which is the cases from just about the end of July through to the end of December 2020. Then we begin with the colors, the green section representing January of 2021, and we see the little rise at the, in the middle of January. We have fairly low numbers of cases in the blue section, which represents the days in February. And then we see a stark change in the direction of that black rolling line and in the heights of uh, the bars in that orange section, which represents the daily cases in March, where we see a steady upward trend. The purple section that may be a little difficult to see at the end of the, uh, the figure is if, uh, the data so far for the month of April. If we move to the next slide, and this is summarized a little differently, we're looking at it now as weekly cases as opposed to the daily. So a little of the fluctuation from day to day is removed to get a better idea of directions and the trends. Again, same colors, gray for 2020, green for the four weeks that constitute January, blue for the four that constitute February. We'll see that there are actually five bars constituting March, and that's really because the last week of March contained at least four days in March and then three from April. So you assign that week to March. So we see that upward trend, the bars getting progressively higher from one week to the next as we proceed through the month of March. And we do note that we had spoken about the relationship between this increase and the change that had been made to the regulations around the uh, sporting activities, the sporting activities involving more, more than 22 persons. So those now have now been reversed, I believe, as at the 1st of April. And we will wait to see what sort of change that has on the trend that we're seeing. The other feature on this graph 
is the background. And that background is the levels of or the percentage of positivity among the samples that were tested. Now, the axes are a little bit difficult to see. They extend off the sides of the page, but the axis that's of relevance is the one on the right-hand side. And the red line is that trend of positivity where we'd have seen between 40 and 45 percent being positive in the peak of the epidemic around September. Again, around week 48, where there was that uh, prison outbreak and we had a lot of positivity coming out of a particular location, the levels were up to 45, 46 percent. And then we had relatively low levels throughout the February period, all the way down to about 2%. And those are again climbing, and they're currently around 11%. That means that out of the samples that we collect, 11% of them have been positive. It doesn't mean that 11% of the population is positive, but that 11% of the people who present to the health system with respiratory illness and get tested have turned out to be positive. Let's go to the next slide. We have the demographic distribution, which remains largely as it has been with about 53% men and approximately 55% of the total cases being in that young working age group, the 25 to 49 year old age group. Moving to the next slide, the fatalities, however, have a different pattern, and that pattern is a three-to-one ratio of men to women. Uh, the actual exact percentage is 73.7% men at this point in time. Another interesting and useful bit of information is that among these deaths, nearly 70% have been in the 60-plus age group. So this is where we're focusing some of our attention right now with respect to prevention. Next slide, please. The geographic distribution will be dealt with in a lot more detail by Mr. Siram Singh. So this is really just a summary of the areas, the communities in which we're seeing cases. And my only comment on this at this point in time is the spread that now includes the East-West Corridor, County Kearney, County Victoria, and County St. Patrick as the uh, largest areas, largest numbers of cases in the communities distributed uh, throughout the, uh, those counties. Next slide. Now, we've spoken about this before, but we want to circle back to these circles. Uh, next slide. We know that when we go out to interact, we go to work, uh, we come back home, we really think that we really just do two things. We go to our workplace and we come back home to our family, whether it's wife and child, wife alone, parents, whoever's in your household, and you believe that these are the members of your circle. So it's a small circle, you know everybody's been, etc. but there's a large fallacy in that assumption. That assumption is usually quite incorrect because, next slide, the people that you interact with have their own circles. Those circles include whoever they may have gone to lime with in a small lime, the people who they go to the gym with, the family members of those individuals. And although we don't interact directly with all of these individuals, next slide please, once there is coronavirus in one of these circles, then the potential for us to have spread to the other circles, next slide, remains. So the contact tracing that we do when we ask about who you've been in contact with goes in two directions, but more in the direction of whom you may have exposed a lot of the time. We will ask the questions on where you've been, who you've been exposed to, where you've gone, but a lot of this information may not be available to you as an individual. You may not know where all of your unseen contacts may have exposed themselves. However, when we do the contact tracing, we do try to ensure that you, as an individual, having been diagnosed with coronavirus, you don't have the opportunity to spread it to too many other people, and those people with whom you would have been in contact while you were infectious are quarantined. Again, using the WHO guidelines, the WHO recommendations, based on their over 112 million case experience is that when people start to manifest symptoms, they may be infective for approximately maybe two days prior to that. So that when we're contact tracing, we'll go back as far as two days beyond or before 
your onset of symptoms. So for example, if you manifested symptoms on April 5th, we will go back as far as April 3rd with looking at who you may have been in contact with to whom you could have spread virus. We wouldn't go further back than that because there's no scientific evidence that supports any risk to people who were in contact with you prior to two days before your onset of symptoms. And when we ask these questions and we get into contact with your contacts, what we are expecting is cooperation in terms of the data, the information that your contacts would share, the information that your contacts would provide in terms of who we may have gone, who you may have gone on to be in contact with subsequently, where you may have been so that we can identify all those at highest risk of potentially being exposed and therefore quarantine appropriately. Now, the onset of symptoms, as we said, the onset of symptoms is those any of those symptoms that we have spoken about in the press conferences prior, whether it is loss of taste and smell, sore throat, fever, whatever it is that you are experiencing. If you're having symptoms, the date that you had those, we use that as our start date and move backwards two days to verify who else you may have been in contact with and could have infected. And in so doing, we hope to limit the potential for onward spread. The other factors that limit the potential for spread are clearly those which we continue to advocate and those are to avoid gatherings if you're ill, to avoid gatherings at any point at this point in time when we're seeing that we're having additional cases in the population, to avoid crowded spaces so you're watching your distance. Make sure that you're wearing your mask and that those around you are also wearing masks. And one of the things that we note with concern is that individuals walk around with the mask on their face but not covering their mouth and nose. If your nose is exposed, then you're essentially not wearing a mask. It's a decoration as opposed to being something functional. So while we may see people with the decorations walking around, the percentage of the population effectively wearing masks has fallen significantly. And we do need to emphasize the importance of that factor uh, as we try to get people to renew the vigor in applying these public health, um, these public health recommendations. Uh, so the watch your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch words continue to be of relevance, continue to be of importance, even as we move forward with our vaccination drive. And just a quick update on the vaccination drive, one of the bits of information I did not include in the EPI update, as at 4 p.m. yesterday, we had vaccinated a total of 6,219 individuals, and the vaccination uh, continued beyond 4 p.m. so that there will be additional updates when next we provide the vaccination figure. With that, I'll turn you back over to Ms. Alcantara. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we go now to the GIS manager at the Ministry of Health, Mr. C. Ram Singh, who will talk about some of the technology that's applied to help manage COVID-19 and all the epidemiological developments. We go to Mr. C. Ram Singh. Thank you very much, Ms. Alcantara. Uh, Ms. Alcantara, Dr. Hines, Mr. Soyafat, uh, members of the media and members of the listening and viewing audience, good morning. Today we move quickly into our first map, uh, which will be a map of cases which we record initially during the period epidemiological weeks 11 and 10. As we look at this map, which was previously presented, we look at the spread of cases. Um, and of course, we see that County Kearney at that point in time would have recorded the highest number of cases. We started to see, of course, at that point, other counties also starting to record cases a little bit more than previously. Now we compare this to the second map, which is on the second slide, which represents data during the epidemiological weeks 12 and 13, which cover the period 21st to 27th of March and 28th of March to the 3rd of April. What we see on the map itself will be a lot more points, representing a lot more patients being recorded in several parts of the country including the East West Corridor. So that will be St. George West, Central and East, as well as the continued uh, presence of cases in Kearney, uh, Victoria and St. Patrick. Now, as we look at the chart, we see that across the board, there would have been an increase in cases in all of the counties. Of course, in some areas such as St. Andrews and David and Riva Mayaro, this increase would have been minimal. But in other counties, such as St. George East, West and Central, Kearney, uh, Victoria and St. Patrick, the increase, the change, sorry, would have been a lot more significant. As we switch across to our next map, we look at the same information just aggregated at a different output area. So what we are seeing here, of course, will be spread 
uh, in various parts of the country, and this would have been during epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, again, uh, covering the period 7th of March, the 20th of March. And we look at this to compare to the other map, which we get on the other slide, looking at the spread of cases during epidemiological weeks 12 and 13, covering the period 21st of March to the 3rd of April in this case. We are seeing more areas recording cases, but not just that, we are also seeing those areas which previously recorded cases, and many of them, they are recording more cases. So it's not just more areas, but also more cases in areas which previously recorded cases. We move quickly to our cluster maps, and we take a look at the clusters which were developed uh, using the data collected during epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, and 12 and 13. And what we are seeing on the left-hand side, which will be data collected during the epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, and this particular cluster map was shared previously, uh, there were 10 clusters recorded at that point in time. At that point in time, the criteria used was three cases minimum during the two-week period and a one-kilometer switch distance. However, given the significant increase in cases uh, between then and now, uh, we changed the criteria slightly to identify these clusters in epidemiological weeks 12 and 13. Uh, the criteria was changed from a minimum of three cases to a minimum of four cases, so it would have been a little bit stricter to find these clusters. However, and even in doing so, we found more clusters. These clusters, of course, in this case, totaling 27, compared to 10 clusters during the period epidemiological weeks 10 and 11. And the spread of these clusters are quite evident on the map, uh, with several being recorded in the east-west corridor area. And we continue to record clusters in central, in Chagonas and the Kuva areas, as well as various parts of County Victoria in San Fernando and Environs, and County St. Patrick in Penal and Environs. We take a look at the charts in the other slide, which gives us a brief breakdown of these clusters. And during the period epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, the highest number of cases recorded in any cluster would have been 11, whereas in epidemiological weeks 12 and 13, the highest number of clusters, cases in any cluster, was 12. Now, during epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, only two clusters out of the 10 recorded, case, recorded six or more cases, whereas during epidemiological weeks 12 and 13, 11 of these clusters recorded either six or more cases per cluster. As we move to the other side, we take a look at a breakdown of the information uh, that we see in both of these maps and the charts which followed. During epidemiological weeks 10 and 11, we recorded 10 clusters as mentioned earlier, compared to 27 during epidemiological weeks 12 and 13. The total number of cluster, cases within clusters sorry, increased from 43 to 164, so it almost quadrupled. The highest number of cases within any cluster, as we would have seen represented on the chart, in the charts, increased from 11 to 12. But looking at the number of clusters which spread within the family or the same home or the same address, we went from 9 out of the 10 to 23 out of the 27 clusters. Now the maximum number of cases within any family or the same home or the same address would have been 5 during the epidemiological weeks 10 and 11 compared to 6 in epidemiological weeks 12 and 13. Now the number of cases within the clusters which were linked to persons within the family or the same home or the same address. So these are cases where at least one person in the home would have been linked to another person in the home. During epidemiological weeks 11, 10 to 11, that would have been 33 out of the 43, so approximately 77%. But in epidemiological weeks 12 to 13, we recorded 87 such cases out of the 164, which is approximately 53%. Now while the percentages may have dropped, the numbers actually increased. As we take a look at the other slide, we see uh, briefly uh, the breakdown of clusters by counties, which we've already gone through. So we would move quickly across to the other slide, which reference or which shares with us the map which Dr. Hines shared earlier. Again, we are seeing many more communities now recording cases. Uh, while in that southern area, in the penal and environs area, we continue to see the highest number of cases recorded in that those particular communities. There are other counties counties and there are other communities within counties which are recording 
cases. This, this map specifically, however, references epidemiological weeks 12, 13 and 14. I just want to point out that we are currently in Epi Week 14, which started last week, Sunday, and ends today. So the data that is represented here will not be complete at this point in time. Uh, as we go forward and we collect the data and we map the cases, of course, the data set will become more complete and the uh, data represented will be probably more accurate at that point in time. As we switch quickly to the other slide, we take a look at the density maps. So when we look at the counties broken down, uh, we consider St. George East, West and Central separately. However, when we aggregate all of the data and look at the density of cases across the counties, uh, we see a lot more heat, about hot areas or a lot higher concentration along the East-West corridor. Of course, other areas are also mentioned, uh, also identifiable, uh, such as in Central and uh, in Victoria in the San Fernando area. So with that, I have come to the end of this presentation, but before I go, I will briefly mention, and I would like to um, highlight again, the GIS-based COVID-19 dashboard, which is currently available. Uh, you could access it by going to health.gov.tt slash COVID-19, selecting the COVID-19 drop-down option, and of course, selecting Trinidad and Tobago COVID-19 dashboard. And with that, I say thank you very much and hand over to Ms. Alcantara. Thank you very much, Mr. Siram Singh. And we are continuing with our series, which feature the CEOs of our regional health authority. And we are really pleased to have with us here today, Mr. Ronald Soyafat, who will update us on the COVID-19 vaccination rollout in the eastern region of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, my colleagues, Dr. Rudy Hines, Mr. Roshan Siamson, and of course, uh, Candy Alcantara. Thank you very much. Okay, just uh, sorry, Mr. Um, oh, Soyafat. I think let's get the introduction again and make okay. sure everyone hears. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, good morning to my colleagues, Dr. Avery Hines, Mr. Roshan Siram Singh, and of course, Candice Alcantara. It's nice to be here. Uh, greetings also to all healthcare workers and to the media and our listening and viewing public. I want to say a special thanks in, as I begin uh, to all our Eastern Regional Health Authority staff and generally to healthcare staff uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, but certainly to the ERHA staff whom I know so well, uh, the ERHA family for your dedication and support during this COVID time. The ERHA has been quite active from the start and will continue uh, to be active. Just to say geographically, we cover from Matlot in the north, uh, right up, right down rather, a straight line down to the south that will include Guayaguayari, Mayaro, uh, Manzanilla, and of course the Valencia area, Corial, Kumuto, you know, all of those areas, Beach and Brothers Road and so on. Um, as we enter our population, rather, I should say, is about 130,000 during the week. And on the weekends, of course, there's a migrant population associated because we have the entire eastern seaboard uh, within the ERHA. As we enter the vaccination phase, we formed a management team, a vaccine management team within the ERHA uh, that was uh, comprised of our hospital staff, as well as our primary care staff, and the, the, the group was led by primary care and included nursing, uh, doctors, HR, quality, communications, a multiple, you know, cross-section of, of the professions within the sector. And uh, we started with an awareness rollout. So we started uh, with staff, increasing the awareness of the vaccine, giving them facts on the vaccine, uh, listening to and, and cautioning on, on the myths associated with the vaccine and saying, you know, sort of taking away those myths. Um, and we, we had a fairly strong reception to that awareness in, in, the, in the staffing area. We rolled out the awareness also in the community, all right, at our clinics and uh, in the general community. We now have, uh, as we moved into the pre-registration phase when we started, we did um, ask 
our staff about their willingness to take the vaccine and so on. And we had 502 staff saying yes, they would take the vaccine. Some were undecided. Uh, we had some no's at 907 and we had some no responses. And we have continuously worked with staff to try to ensure that we reach out to them to encourage them to do take the vaccines. Uh, maybe I should let you know some of the numbers or before that to say also that we've used uh, Facebook as a medium. We've reached out to, to community and staff also through the um, some of the private sector uh, communications organizations such as the Mayaro Cable uh, Company uh, who have been, you know, providing that on online and so on for us on their TVs. And all staff text, our all staff text system, uh, we have been communicating COVID vaccine messages to our staff to try to encourage our staff. We also have indicated that, um, you know, we, we have three right now in this first phase, we have four centers, the Rio Claro, uh, 24 hour accident and emergency. We have our Mayaro district health facility again, 24 hours. The Toko 24 hour accident and emergency, and the Sangre Grande enhanced health center. All of these these facilities have clusters of health centers around them, and we use those clusters of health centers um, to make the relationship between the, the lead facility and those clusters in terms of ensuring that we reach the community served by those health centers. So we're doing vaccines to staff daily at all facilities. We're doing the CNCD, chronic non-communicable disease clinic members at those facilities, from those facilities, um, surrounding also the, the, the main centers. And uh, we are also doing the over 60 population with uh, CNCDs that by appointment. What we've done is uh, we've also instituted, uh, because of the geography of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, as you would recognize, we're moving from Matlot and coming down and so on, so that we've instituted a shuttle service so that on the days when Matlot or Guaya um, or Grand River or anybody has um, a chronic disease clinic, we will shuttle transport our chronic disease patients to the main centers to have their vaccines. And that shuttle service has been commissioned in both uh, St. Andrew, St. David, right, and in um, Nariva Mayaro, where we have Brothers Road and Beach as part of the Rio Claro facility, and Guaya Guayari as part of the Mayaro facility. So that shuttle service has been commissioned and is working. Our experience over the past four days, we've had a fairly slow pickup. So far, we have vaccinated 643 people uh, at our centers. Staff, we have vaccinated 170. And for clinics, uh, clinics uh, participants, as well as appointments, we vaccinated 473 uh, persons. We also have a number of appointments that we have outstanding now uh, that have been made over the last uh, four days, and we continue to with our rollout. Um, I should say that the, the numbers have been consistent, but we've been seeing a little rise as we move forward, so we expect that uh, we will be getting an even further increase in the coming days. Moving forward. Based on our observations of a fairly slow uptake, uh, we have now started, as of this morning, community announcements. So we are miking in the communities, advising our residents that the over 60 population uh, with uh, CNCDs are invited to make appointments using our telephone system, and you saw the numbers earlier, uh, using our telephone system and also using our WhatsApp system. And I personally tested that this morning in terms of the WhatsApp system, and I got responses from the facilities. So the, the facilities are online and responsive. So the community miking uh, has, has started this morning. 
we're talking to the communities asking the over 60s as, as i said to make appointments and we're pointing out that we're discouraging walk-in clients we want them to make their appointments and uh, give us the information ahead of time so that we can you know effectively move the process forward the whatsapp lines as i say have been established eight to four and seven days per week additional clerical staff and support nursing support staff has been provided uh, to our appointment areas and that's important because as we started we recognized the little inefficiencies in between um, and we saw the need to put nursing staff with the appointments so that we can get um, you know our appointments more efficiently handled along with as i said additional clerical and nursing support and uh, we just hope that at all health centers all the four centers we will have the uptake we encourage people to come in for their vaccines we encourage our staff um, to, to come in for their vaccines because it's, it's important um, just to give you again the numbers all right that we can be reached at um, those are the numbers as you see there the Mayaro district health facility and let me pass it on to Candice and I, I'm sure she will highlight those numbers Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer-Fat. And of course, we continue to encourage persons to visit the social media pages at the Ministry of Health and all our regional health authorities as they continue to provide information on how to get the COVID-19 vaccine if you're eligible. And we go back now uh, to Dr. Hines, who is going to clarify one important matter in the public domain. We go to Dr. Hines. Okay, thank you, Ms. Alcantara. I'm going to circle back to the conversation we're having about contact tracing and about the relevant time frames during which you would contact trace after someone has been diagnosed positive. Uh, one of the matters that seems to be circulating in the public domain, of course, is the fact that the Prime Minister would have been diagnosed as COVID positive by a test done on the 6th of April. And uh, we are aware that the symptoms he had would have started on the 5th of April. So giving a good example, because I know the questions have been asked, they've been asked of me directly as well. Uh, the people who would have been in contact with him at the press conference on the 27th or in Parliament the day before would fall long before the onset of symptoms, well outside of that two-day window that we give before the onset of someone's symptoms when they could have been infectious. So the queries that have come into the public domain around contact tracing for that particular time scale really don't apply. If the symptoms start on a given date, we move two, dates back, two days backwards, and this is based on the existing and updated WHO guidance for contact tracing, updated as at February 2021. That can be uh, looked up on the WHO site. You can download it and read it yourself. But the science suggests that the 48-hour time scale is all that is relevant. And given the fact that the symptoms for the, P the PM started on the 5th of April, that takes us two days backwards. So those in press conference, those in parliament the day before, don't actually run any risk of exposure to an infectious person at that point in time. So just that's a practical example of exactly what we were speaking about previously when we spoke about the contact tracing and the timelines. And I just wanted to use that example to, uh, to make it more concrete and more relatable. So thank you, Ms. Alcantara. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines, for that very important clarification. And we go now to the question and answer segment. We ask our media representatives, please begin by stating your name and the name of the media house that you represent before putting forward your two questions, please, to our panelists. Um, we are limited with time, um, so please be brief. And if we can come back, we will allow additional questions. We begin this morning with questions from AZP News. Hi, good morning. Friday Hari, ezpnews.com. Um, my first question has to do with the reporting of samples by the ministry. Um, I, I want to, to go to the, to the um, updates given on April 6th, 7th, and 8th. They all include samples that were taken on April 5th. So I just wanted to find out what is the policy there in reporting from a certain day. Is it that 
uh, when samples are done in one day, it, it, why is it reported over three days? That's my first question. And my second question, um, someone has reached out to us and wanted to find out if someone is, is asymptomatic but COVID-19 positive and gets the vaccine, what happens in a case like that? Thank you. Okay, thank you for those two questions. With regard to the first, what we do when we update and provide the time frame during which samples were collected is we just update you on what, what the span the samples that we reported on will belong to. It may vary from uh, one day to the next, and as the volume increases, you may see changes, variations, but really and truly what we're seeing is that the a given day's report would include samples that may extend as far back as a 48-hour period. And it's also important to bear in mind that, so for example, today's or yesterday's update was the up to the, as at the 9th, with samples between the 6th and the 8th. We will still have samples from the 7th and the 8th in today's update, so more cases would be applied to those days in the epi curve. So when you look at the epi curve, that's why you see slight differences from the numbers of cases reported on a given day. So what we try to do is we try to give you some additional information, some additional background on when those samples would have been received and which samples have been reported on. But it's not a fixed, uh, it's not a fixed number, it's not a fixed date. We just let you know what time span has been covered by the new set of positives that, uh, that is reported on a given day. The second question is quite a good one. The honest answer is that we're not 100% sure. We do know that if individuals are symptomatic for any viral illness, we advise them not to be vaccinated while symptomatic. If you are asymptomatic, however, uh, there is no way to know <laughs> that you're infected. And there is not yet a body of scientific evidence that suggests what would happen in such a case. So it is really a matter of be as aware as you can be of your general symptoms, even feelings of malaise, etc. You may want to rethink going out to be vaccinated. But if you're asymptomatic and infected and vaccinated, while we don't foresee a major issue, it's still left to be seen. The scientific evidence still has to be reviewed before we can give a definitive answer on that. But thank you for raising it. And as information becomes available, we will certainly bring those, uh, those facts to the fore. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We go now to Express Newspaper, please. Are we ready with Express? Hi, good morning, Camille Hunt, Express. Um, I was hoping the minister would be here, but maybe Dr. Hines can shed some light on this. Um, now that the, the African Union has halted plans to buy the AstraZeneca vaccine, how is this going to affect our supply, given that the, the largest batch was supposed to come from them? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there was never any firm commitment from the African Union. There were several discussions with multiple places, but the confirmed batches, the batches that had been spoken about as confirmed and incoming, did not include the batch from the African Union, so that doesn't affect our supply given the information that we would have presented before on what is expected and scheduled to come in at this point in time. Thank you. And we go to TTT, please. Yes, hi. Good morning. Sonal Lala from TTT News. Um, question to Mr. Soyafat. I'm not sure if I, um, I'm not sure if, if the audio was a bit um, in and out. So is, um, has there been an overwhelming of the lines with persons trying to get through to register for the vaccine in the ERHA? No, there has not been. Um, we have been uh, responding to the calls that have been coming in, but uh, recognizing that you have uh, our data entry clerk who is uh, answering calls and putting in data and so on, so that we found, um, along with the, the Ministry of Health, of course, that there has been a need to rethink. So we've added now uh, nationally, uh, and that includes the ERHA, some WhatsApp lines, so that at each facility we have a WhatsApp facility, so that uh, the population has a choice now. They can call in directly on the phone line, 
or they can WhatsApp in their request, uh, and that we think will improve the efficiency. Thank you very much uh, to CEO. And we go to uh, Dr. Hines, I think, has some additional information. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a little additional information, maybe t uh, to clarify, to expand further on the question that was asked concerning the African Medical Supplies Platform that we have a confirmed order that has not been unconfirmed since uh, of 875,000 with 250,000 of those being from uh, Pfizer and 625 from Johnson and & Johnson and the sales contract is currently in the final stages of getting completed. So that is the most recent update with respect to the African Medical Supplies platform, hoping that answers the query that was placed earlier. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines, and we're very, very happy to have up-to-date information even during this conference. And we go back to AZP News for a follow-up question, please. Hi, morning again. Um, uh, Dr. Hines, um, Dr. Hines, just to follow up, um, so I, are you saying that in terms of the samples, that for example, samples done on one day, um, it takes at least three days for, um, uh, for them to be completed and, and therefore reported? Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when we do samples, especially to get larger and larger numbers of samples coming in, what we give you at the bottom is the date range throughout which the confirmed samples for a given day would have been collected. It's not that it necessarily take that length of time to be processed, but there's a range of days and we give you the oldest to the newest in the, the range that we give you. So for example, we give you from the, the 5th to the 8th or the 6th to the 8th, that means the oldest sample within that uh, group of positives came from as far back as the 6th, the newest came from as far back as the 8th. And that will vary, it will be, it's something that we assess on a day-to-day -day basis and update when we provide the media release. Thank you very much. And we have a follow-up question from TTT, please. Hi, good morning again, Sonal Lala, TTT. Um, Mr. Hines, with cases on the rise, would there be any need to commission any more uh, step-down or quarantine facilities? And uh, can you just give me a uh, clarify, uh, with also cases on the rise, how many COVID tests are being done nationally on a daily rate? Because I know we have cases as much as 44 and 47 a day. Um, can, how, how, if this continues to rise, how many, can you tell us, are being done on a daily rate and what's the maximum that can possibly be uh, tested on a daily rate? Okay, thank you for that question. At the current occupancy rates, there isn't at this time a need to commission additional facilities, but that is something that we continue to monitor. And as, as you have noted, the cases, the numbers of cases have increased the occupancy within the existing facilities has also increased we still have uh, we're still well within our capacity to manage the volume that currently exists if there is a need to commission additional facilities that update will be brought into a subsequent press conference the daily rate of testing does vary depending on demand so in the last couple of days we would have seen uh, over 400 tests in some cases being done varying between three and four depending on again depending on volume we have since the start of the epidemic expanded capacity quite significantly so that there are now a few labs that actually do the testing and follow uh, follow the existing guidelines that uh, that we have put in place to ensure that the testing is valid so with that expanded capacity and the numbers of people coming in we are in a good place with respect to our ability to keep peace with the demand and uh, as the demand goes up and the number of cases uh, the number of tests go up we will continue to report on what you're seeing what we what we did today with the positivity giving you an idea of out of the number of tests that we've done, what percentage has been positive. So you get a clearer metric for what's changing in the population. Hopefully this information will be considered useful. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We have a question now from Newsday Newspaper. Hi, good morning. My name is Ria Chitram. I just have a question concerning uh, the process to register for the vaccine. There was a case where 
concerning Assemblyman Kelvin Morris, where it is alleged that he jumped the COVID vaccine line, but he cleared it up and said that he just registered. Um, is the registration process just for the age group 60 and over, or persons below that can register? Is the system uh, capable of taking that sort of registration? How would you advise people to go forward in terms of registering for the COVID-19 vaccine? And we'll go to Mr. Soyafat for a response. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, the, with respect to Tobago, the, the Tobago process, uh, I will not be able to, to you know, shed any light on. But certainly I can say uh, within the Eastern Regional Health Authority, you have two avenues to register, all right, for your COVID vaccine. You can ring or call in to the number that has been provided. And uh, when you call into that number, uh, some information will be gathered from you. That will enable us to be able to prioritize you and get you into the system. Uh, the other way is, of course, through using the WhatsApp number. If you use the WhatsApp number, similar information will be required from you, and uh, that will enable us to give you the appointment. All right? Um, even in the case of walk-in persons, if a person walks into the facility, they're not vaccinated immediately. They will be uh, used, th that appointment will be given at that time. So the person will be given an appointment, all right, and uh, they will come in on, on the day of their appointment. So that it is a, a regularized process that will ensure that there's equity in this. Thank you very much. And we go to Guardian newspaper, please. Okay, seem to have a little issue there. Let's go to AZP News then. Hi, good morning again. Um, I just wanted to find out, um, has the contract tracing been done with, with regards to the Prime Minister? And can you say how many um, of his contacts you all were able to trace in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary, and, and are any of them in, in isolation at this point in time? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. All questions relating to the details of contact tracing for the Prime Minister would best be handled by the Tobago Regional Health Authority, Tobago House of Assembly, Tobago's uh, CMOH. What we can say is that yes, all the contact tracing has been carried out and that all relevant individuals uh, who would have been in relevant contact would have been placed into quarantine and testing would have been done. Uh, the numbers, that would be something that the Tobago authorities would better address. Thank you very much. And I'm not sure if we have a question from Guardian at this point in time. Okay, so at this point, I think we have come to the end of our press conference this morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember that even though we continue to have a high uptake of COVID-19 vaccine throughout the country, everyone must continue to follow the health guidelines. It's as simple as three W's. Wash your hands, watch your distance from others, and of course, wear your mask. We leave you with a video on COVID-19 vaccines from the BBC. If you haven't already had a coronavirus vaccine, it's likely you'll be offered one at some point. For many people, this can't come soon enough, but others may feel wary about having a new vaccine in case it makes them feel unwell. First, let's look at how some of them work to see why they can't give you COVID. mRNA vaccines use a tiny piece of the virus's genetic code called messenger RNA. This is how Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna's vaccines are made. Viral vector vaccines carry DNA that contains a piece of the coronavirus genome. This has been put into a less harmful virus that's been weakened so it can't make you ill. It's how the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is made. The DNA or mRNA work by instructing your cells to make lots of tiny spike proteins. These are usually found on the surface of coronavirus, but they're harmless on their own, which is why you can't catch COVID from these vaccines. But the spike proteins are enough to make your body think it's been infected, which gives it the information it needs to protect against future attacks. Other vaccines contain parts of coronavirus, and some, like Coronavac and Covaxin, contain the whole virus. 
This is inactivated, so it cannot cause infection. It's normal for people to suffer mild symptoms after being vaccinated, such as a headache or a raised temperature. This is not the disease itself, but the body responding well to the vaccine. It shows you're having an immune response. Millions of people have already had a vaccine, and very few have reported severe side effects, like an allergic reaction. But, as with most medicines, there is always a risk. Because of this, there are groups of people who may be advised against vaccination in case it makes them unwell. Those who are allergic to a specific ingredient, for example, should be offered an alternative vaccine. Advice varies between countries and should be available on your government website or through your doctor. Scientists around the world have been working hard to ensure the safety of coronavirus vaccines. And as more people are vaccinated against COVID, we should be able to gradually return to our normal daily lives. This is TTT. Live for local.